It's it's actually been raining since in the afternoon, and uh, the weather is a little bit cold for now. Yeah, just complicated for now, you know. Not hot, <laughs> not cold. <laughs> okay, just stop in the middle. Okay, so uh, on this show, IPM I feel write music on the background as the listeners are listening, and our guests tell us the story. And uh, your case, you just you just got your first invitation to the Super Eagles. So let me start it from top before we go back to the beginning. How did you manage okay. to get a Super Eagles, Super Eagles invitation while you're playing for Slovakia? What happened? Ah, uh, actually, it's uh, a very long story and uh, a little bit complicated because um, you know before the season starts, you guys who played many matches like preseason, play other big teams, other small teams, just to see who we will start with. And I've been here since last season, but throughout last season, I didn't get to play a game. I played, I think, the last match of the season, in which there was nothing to lose. And uh, <laughs> yeah, so they gave me the match to test my ability to see what I can do in terms of uh, controlling the pressure, the car, uh, the fans, you know. So it went well after the season, last season, this season, we started pre season. We played like four or five matches. I got to play the five matches and I didn't consider a goal. And uh, I have a colleague, of course, the other goalkeeper. So he also played. And uh, unfortunately, I think in the five matches, he considered six goals. So oh. in the beginning of the season, I was hoping that, uh, yeah, I was hoping that I would start in the match. But unfortunately, the coach didn't put me in the match. He, he started the other goalkeeper due to some reasons, I think. So we lost 6 nil to a very good side. And uh, then they gave me the chance in the second match, which I played. We won 4 nil, And uh, since then, I've been playing. And we played, I think, if I'm not mistaken, we have played like six matches. I personally have played like six matches until date. We haven't lose. We only draw, I think. Yeah. So... I think that's it. And I think the Super Eagles and the coaches and everyone, you know, they were looking at it. And I think that's why they called me. They think I deserve to, to be called the Super Eagles. Yeah. Okay. Okay. This invitation, back in the day, the way national team invitation goes is uh, they'll send a fax, a fax message to your club and then your club secretary will come to you and tell you, oh, you should go to the club office. And then when you get to the club office, they tell you, the national team have sent an invitation for you to start preparing for your flight to go and represent your country. And uh, this is the place where it is. This is the direction you're together with said. But we don't know how it is done today. This is the era of social media. How did they contact you? How did the Nigerian national team or the Nigerian Federation contact you? Okay, I, I think uh... First of all, someone, I saw the rumors on the news, you know, that they want to invite me to the Super Eagles, but I wasn't sure because nothing is certain. So I I kept my finger crossed. I, I continue doing the good thing I'm doing, keep, keep the, uh, the uh, football going well. And I was, I was there one day and someone contacted me. He said he's the chief scout of the Super Eagles coach. And he asked me some few things, and I said, okay, fine. Then he, contact, he contacted me that the head coach would like to talk to me. So he gave him, I should give him my number. So I gave him my number. And uh, on that faithful day, I think we have a match, a real match we're going. So I saw, I saw a chat. Normally, I don't normally go to WhatsApp. If I have a match, I have to focus. So I saw the chat, but I didn't get to reply till after the match. So I opened it. When I opened it, I saw that it was the uh, Super Eagles coach, Janet Chua, that sent me the message. And I replied to him, told him that, I'm sorry for the late reply. I was playing the match. And he said, yeah, he watched the match. So he said it was a good one. And he said he would like to invite me to the Super Eagles. And I said, OK, cool. I will appreciate it. And we spoke a bit. And I uh, Wow, that's, that's, that's a beautiful story. It tells you that 
obviously Janat Rao, the coach of the Super Eagles, uh, someone that I love dearly too, uh, spends his time uh, because last time I spoke with him uh, during the Bayern uh, competition, he said that he's got a few scouts uh, scattered across Europe and even in Nigeria that helps him to monitor players. Having said that, Mafi Yakubu, let's go to the beginning of the story. Who are you from? What state are you from? What tribe are you? Who are your parents, your brothers and sisters? Or you just appeared out of nowhere. Who is Matthew Yakubu? Now you're going to play for Nigeria national team. So you're answerable to all of us. You're no longer a private citizen. You are our goalkeeper <laughs> now. So tell us the story. Where are you coming from? Okay, my name is Matthew Yakubu. I came from the northern part of uh, uh, Nigeria. And uh, I have uh, Two sisters. Another so part of Nigeria, of please, please, please educate me. Another part of Nigeria is very different. Yeah, Where is the north? From, Where is the north? Yeah, from, from Kaduna State, but was born and brought up in Zaria, in Kaduna State. Okay. And uh, I'm, I'm in the family of five, but we lost one. Yeah, we lost one. And uh, I have two sisters, two brothers. So I think. Uh, I schooled in Zaria, Kaduna State, and uh, my mom and dad are from there. Um, my language is Java, it's under Kaduna State, though. So I think that's all. That's all, yeah. Um, that's where I came from. Okay, so keep the story going. Now let's know how you mean you got into this football team, how you got to play for Click Sports and the other teams you played for, how you went to Europe. Let's get this story. We need to know the struggles, the good, the bad, and the ugly, the highs and the lows. We need to know that. Yes, it was it was indeed a very tough journey, like a very hard one, because it all started with me playing for the academy in Kaduna State. It's called FC Academy. Like they brought up players, and uh, then I get to after playing, my senior brother introduced me to the football. Then I was like, okay, it's fine. I will, I will do it because I like doing it, playing from the street. So he said, I need to join the academy so I will play more and know more about the game. So he took me, he handed me over to a coach called Coach Tama in Pepsi Academy. So when I was there, he was like, I was a striker then. Wow. Yeah, I wasn't a goalkeeper. So, so how did you go from being a striker to <laughs> being a goalkeeper? Yeah. Okay, it happens like this. There was this day we were training in the academy and uh, we, are, we, the junior boys, are done training. So the senior boys are training and there was, there was just only one goalkeeper. So he asked, the coach asked who we keep. So I decided that I will go in goal. Then I go in goal. Then he was surprised. They were playing short. I was saving them. And the team was so fun to me. Like it was so fun to me. So. I, he said that I would be a goalkeeper. I said, no, I don't want to be a goalkeeper. So in the next training, he kept putting me in goals. Why me? I don't want it. Sometimes I would cry. I would tell him I don't want to keep. And I complained to my brother that took me to the academy. He met the coach. He told him that uh, this guy don't need to be keeping. He said he wants to play. But unfortunately, he said no. He saw something that I should continue doing this. And that was how I started goalkeeping. And since then... I've become a goalkeeper to the other date, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Do you do you miss being a striker? Do you do you sometimes think like, okay, if I was a striker, my chances would have been better, or you feel like, okay, you know what, becoming a goalkeeper was even better for me. Actually, sometimes at the point when while I was playing, I tried being a striker again, okay. and um, it was fun when when. When it's very fun when you score a goal and uh, people are celebrating you, you know. Yeah, I and uh, it was so fun to me. I felt, I felt, uh, I really like it because uh, if I score, people will celebrate that I score. So, but at a point, I look at it and people were like, you know, you better in post, you better be a goalkeeper. And I said, okay, fine. If they say so, then I decided that I will just do this once and for all. And uh, I went in wholeheartedly that I would just be a goalkeeper. So that was how I chose to be a goalkeeper over being striker. 
Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so let's look at it from this perspective. You know, we're not in an era where, apart from holding on to the ball, saving with your hands, stretching your hand wide, which was the primary criteria to being a good goalkeeper, anticipation, area judgment, and the rest, you are not expected to use your foot very well. Timing, passing the ball, pick, making decision on who to pass the ball to. Do you think that starting as a striker has not given you that advantage over other natural goalkeepers who started as goalkeepers? Because most goalkeepers really don't know how to use their leg well. Do you think being a striker, you know, strikers are instinctive and uh, ball control is part of one of the major elements of being a striker. Do you think that starting as a striker is not something very good? And then being in goal and as a former striker, does it make it easy for you to judge what the striker that is attacking against you is going to do? Yeah, actually, I would say I would say it helped me a bit because actually, I at first I don't really know how to use the ball. Yeah, I know there are some moments where I I try to use the ball and I make a lot of mistakes. So at a point, sometimes. Coach Olumide, I remember vividly one time that Man City have crisis of goalkeeper that Pep Guardiola signed. He said he wouldn't use Joe Hart because Joe Hart don't know how to use his feet. And uh, he brought the goalkeeper from, I think, Barcelona, Bravo, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So at that, at that point, our coach, I was in click then. Then our coach brought the philosophy to click. Coach Olumide Adibolade, he said that uh, all his goalkeepers, must learn how to use their feet in terms of playing from behind, apart from saving reflexes, area balls, that everyone that is under him must learn how to play with his feet. And I was like, this is gonna be interesting. <laughs> so I think we are like we were like we were like five goalkeepers if I'm not mistaken. We are like five goalkeepers. So everyone was doing what they know how to do, intensifying, we try to play deep. Sometimes we make mistakes, especially on a sandy pitch where you pass sometimes the ball will like yeah. go to another direction. So we kept we kept practicing day by day, day by day, day by day. Then we started applying it in match situation. We made a lot of mistakes. But he, he kept encouraging us that yeah, if we can do it on this sandy pitch, it means if we get a good pitch, we'll do it. So at a point I think I have an edge over other guys. Because I pick it up and mix it like with me being a striker before I've played before. So I have a little bit confidence more than them. And uh, I think he encouraged me more. And at a point, we can't even kick long kick in click sport. In click sport, it's a taboo for you to kick long kick. You just have to find a way to play behind, even if they are pressing you. So it, it was so, 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 so. Uh, interesting and uh, I think he made me to learn more how to play with my feet. Yeah. Okay, so I met uh, a player that played on that, that trained on that coach, Ajibulade Ulumidi, and he said something that he has played football under 11 different coaches, but has never met a coach as intelligent and as good as coach Ajibulade Ulumidi. You, before you came to Click Sports, before you met Ajiboladi Lumidi, who happens to be the under-19 coach of uh, Remo Stars right now. If you compare all the coaches that you worked with, even the ones in Europe right now, how would you rate coach Ajiboladi Lumidi? Yeah, I think uh, coach Lumidi Ajiboladi is is something that is one of the best coaches I've played under. Though I've not played in, uh, under many coaches because I didn't play so many teams. But I, if I must say, he's one of the best coaches I've ever seen until date, even in Europe, you know, because uh, he believes in his tactics. He don't change his plans. Even if you are winning him, he sticks to what he teaches in training because uh, sometimes, you know, some coaches when, uh, when they are playing the match and uh, they are losing, they switch plans, you know, like they change plans, they got, they will get confused and maybe they will change. But he, he I don't think he used to change his plan. He stick to, always stick to what he normally teaches us in training. He will tell us, no, the plan will pay us. And, and 
And that's something that sometimes we'll be losing like one minute in a match, like 85 minutes, but we'll keep doing what we do in training. We won't force the ball, you know? So I think it's one of the best coach, like the best coach I've played under in my academy level. Yeah. All right. So uh, talk to me about your sojourn in Europe so far. How did you get to, uh, what's it called? Slovak. What happened? You just slept one day, like the way the Super Eagles score. You just slept one day, somebody called you and said, yeah, carry your bag, carry your kaya, your parangida, yeah, let's go to Slovakia. Actually, my, my journey to Slovakia uh, is also a little bit complicated because uh, at first I was, I got the invitation when I was home, when I was at the national team, that uh, I was an, you know, the 20. And they want me to come and uh, then we left for the preparation for World Cup in Germany. I was in Germany uh, and uh, my boss told me that, okay, they said they will come and watch your training so they will know if they will sign you, maybe you don't need to do the trials, you can just go and sign. And I was like, uh, yeah, it's going, to cool. it's going to be cool, they should come. So they didn't come, then I think five, five days to World Cup, I was dropped at Germany. And then uh, my boss called me. I was crying, you know, so sad. Yeah. So he, <laughs> so he, he told me that, uh, would you like to go to Slovakia now to go to the club? And I told him like, I would like to go, but I can't go now because at this stage of my football now, I can't concentrate. Like I can't give up my best. I need I need to go home settle down, rethink, let the football of the national team on the, the world play. Let it just go, you know, it go, then I can, I can, I can go to Slovakia and see what it will cost and play. So we went to back to Nigeria and uh, I was expecting that I would travel. Then they called me for the national team, Morocco, that uh, who can go. So. And at that time, we were three that would come to Serret. So the two guys, they later came, while me, I went for the national team. Yeah. And they sent my contract. That I don't need, I don't need to, I don't need to do trials. I should just, I, I can sign. So I signed wow. for traveling. So then when I went, uh, then after the tournament, I came back home. I was expecting that maybe I would, I'll go maybe in two weeks time or three weeks time. Then they start. We started preparing the paperwork, and it took long. Spent like, if I'm not mistaken, like spent like like six months in Nigeria before traveling again. So at that point, I was like, I don't know. I don't know what will happen uh, if, if if maybe the club will still want me. So. Unfortunately, they send the papers, they send the documents, but I came late. They went and signed another goalkeeper from Stoke City, Whoa. England. Because the season was about to start and I wasn't there and they can't wait for me. True. So, yeah, yeah we applied for the visa and we have to go to Kenya because in Nigeria, in the Slovak embassy in Nigeria, they don't give visa. So we, we went to Kenya, then we, have, we now started having some difficulties in the documents or blah, blah, blah. And it took us like a month again. We stayed in a month, like a month in Kenya. Okay. So after that, we came to Slovakia and uh, we started playing and uh, it wasn't really going well. You know, so, uh, so many things, many things were up, you know, how they how we do, how to settle down. And, uh, you know, sometimes if you don't give out your best, they don't, sometimes they don't give a fuck. So we did our best and uh, this is where we are now. Yeah, it is just what it is. Okay, so uh, let's talk about settling into Slovakia. Uh, did you ever have issues with the food, the people, racism? What were the challenges you had settling into a new country, 
was the first time in your life that you were getting to deal with winter and all that stuff. How was it like? Okay, when I when I came, I in my club there is this Nigeria guy that I've been here for like two years, like two seasons. Yeah. <clears throat> His name is Banki. So it's Bankola de Korea is from I think Equity State or Ogun State yet. So uh, he have been here and uh, he helped me to settle down. Like he showed me around, he showed me things, how they do things here. He tells me about the club, how it works. He like he, he showed me many things like uh, that. We helped me to settle down. He helped me to settle down. And uh, yeah, you know, there is uh, how will I put it in 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 the Europe here. Yeah. When you when you come and uh, during the winter, it's very difficult for we African players because we are not used to that cold, you know. True. So it was so difficult because we, yeah because we train. But during when I came, then the pandemic started, the coronavirus stuff started, and uh, then we, I was doing personal training under the weather. Was getting used to it. Was getting used to it before they started train training and. Uh, and the club help us with some clothes, you know, that you put on that the cold won't be that much when you're training. So uh, it wasn't easy. I'm talking about uh, the racism. My club, like, they accepted me and uh, they were so kind, like, they showed me love and make me to be also settle down very well. Yeah. How about the food? I mean, what was the food like? Is it the same kind of? Do you have swallow? Do you have uh, two ocean kafa? Do you have masa, fura? Do you have it over there? <laughs> because I'm just what you're used to he, over here in Nigeria. He just, he just, he just that uh, sometimes you know. I want to know about footballers is whatever wherever you go to, you just have to adapt to what they eat there, the system and everything. So when I came here. I was seeing some kind of pastas that I don't even know. I've not seen it before. <laughs> <laughs> so it was <clears throat> it was so funny when I saw it. The first day, I was like, they brought something like water with spark inside. <laughs> and Spagas. <laughs> you have to, you have to like, yeah, like you have to take the water. Yeah, uh -huh. you have to take the water. If you take the water out of the spark before they will bring the proper food for you to eat. That's appetizing. And I was like, is this the food? Yeah, I was like, is this the food? They said, no, you have to take this. Is this soup? I was like, must I said, okay, let me try. So I I I I took some of it and not bad. Then they brought the food. They brought another kind of food. And I was like, ah, what is this again? So I ate a bit, but with time I get used to it. Normally, sometimes, like, I go to Banky's apartment, like his house, he has some Nigerian food there. So I will, sometimes we we'll go to eat Eba, he do a goosey, you know, because he has been here. So yeah. He knows his way of getting. So, <laughs> so sometimes we we'll go there, I go to eat there. If I, if I, if they cook something in the club restaurant, I don't like, I will just tell him, okay, Egbon, I'm coming to your house now. Please prepare something, and I will go and I will eat a bit there, and I will come back to my own house. That's how it has been going. <laughs> okay, so so let's talk about let's talk about coaches now. You know, when I first went to Europe, I realized that the way coaches do in Europe is different from how they do here, and then the expectation, the workload. What was it like? You know, in Nigeria, yeah, the, the coach that is coaching the, the players as an unfit player is the same person that is coaching the goalkeepers, coaching everybody. But then you go to Europe, the goalkeeper coaches are different than the main coach, the, the manager, and you go for meetings, they tell you, oh, you will not make the team today, you will be reserved. They tell you people how to dress. Give me that information. What was the brief that the club gave you? What to wear, how to wear them when you're going for matches? What was the code of conduct like? when you join your club? Uh, when I... Yeah, hello. 
All right, uh, network has chosen to rear its ugly head at a time when I needed uh, a very good answer for that question because, I mean, okay, uh, your, your network was freezing. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can, I can hear you. Okay, so you, they, you know, there are many coaches. It's not all about one coach. There are many coaches, there are strength and conditioning coaches, there's the head coach, there's the goalkeeper coach, there's so many people, you know. And uh, so you, you just have to do what everybody will see and they would say you deserve to play. So sometimes, sometimes you it's not about trying to play the goalkeeper coach or trying to play the head coach. You just have to carry them along and give them reasons for them to play you. So I... In that aspect, I take every training very, very serious. I take it like a final. I take it like it's just the last day of training for me. So, I, at a point, at a point, the goalkeeper coach met me. He was like, you are a very good goalkeeper. I will talk to them about you, how they will make you settle down where. And I think he did. He spoke to them and they said, okay, the coach liked me too, the, good, the technical crew, because even the players, you, know, you have to be, you have to be friendly with them. You don't have to be frowning. So sometimes, sometimes you behave like like a fool to get what you want, you know. And uh, <laughs> yeah, so so sometimes uh, before the training, I'll go check the footballs. After the training, I'll pack the footballs, pack the things to the dressing room before I will take my bath and leave. So in that aspect, like you get. Uh, they got to know more about me until today. I'm doing the same. I'm packing the football. Though it's, it's the young players that are supposed to be. But till today, I pack footballs after training. I do many things, just like as usual. I'm used to it in click. When they taught us, you know, he would tell us that goalkeeper, you need to carry the balls, the pitch, you have to do this. So I, I brought that thing to Europe where I'm now to the club. So I'm, and I'm doing the same, which is, I think, it's really normal. So. It's what it is, yeah. Okay, so let's go to your first game, your first competitive game for the club. You know, you played that game where, I mean, it was a dead rubber game. Thereafter, tell us, you know, what the coach told you. Normally, some coach will call you aside and say, see me in my office and then sit down and tell you this match. Uh, this is what we're looking for in this game. This is what we expect you to do. This is our tactics. What was the first conversation before March, what was it like? Uh, I remember I remember it was last season, my first match was last season when we went to the pitch. We were in the pitch, like looking the pitch. And then he called me, he told me that this is my first match. I have to give up my best. I have to do everything, no mistakes, nothing, nothing. I, have, I should just try to be composed, forget about the fans. Forget about who is watching me. I should just be myself and do what I normally do in training. So I said, okay, fine. But I make some mistakes, you know, first match, uh, a little bit pressure. Some people are talking, some people are shouting, the fans are shouting. I make I make some mistakes, which I he spoke to me during the halftime and I pick it up and I I play to what he wants. I, he said, he, he uh, you know, you have different coaches, they have different plans, you know, some coaches play from behind, some play long. So I think I did what he wanted me to do and he decided, uh, okay, fine, we'll see more about you. And that is it. So uh, in some teams, you just click, apart from Bankoli, who's obviously in Nigeria, in some teams, defenders don't like goalkeepers shouting at them. Something like, oh, you shot too much, don't shout at me. Don't you know I'm your senior, this kind of thing, I'm a captain, I'm older than you in this team. Have you ever had the issue? Because goalkeepers must talk. One of the things that a goalkeeper, you must talk, you shout. But some are crazy. Some I've, I've, I've played with goalkeepers that are crazy. Some are erratic. Some can even punch you in the head. <laughs> what has been your own experience as a goalkeeper with your defenders, especially your defenders? Yeah, and uh, I think I think in the defense line, I'm the youngest in the team in the defense line, and uh, there's this thing we normally do in 
quick spot. There was a time that Otolimide would taught us many things, like moments where you need to talk, and there are moments you don't need to be shouting, saying a lot of things. You just pick the moment and talk. So I think uh, sometimes you have to read your defenders. You have to know, okay, if I shout for this one, he will get confused. I need to encourage him. You have to know everybody that you are that is playing in front of you. So sometimes if they make mistakes, I try to encourage them. You know, I don't think I've ever shouted on a defender in Serer. You know, I just try my best to encourage them because of course they will make mistakes. They will make mistakes. So I try to encourage them. I try to make them see that they can do better. And you know, sometimes when they when they do the good things, I run to them, I hug them, I shout on them, yeah, good, good, good. I encourage them. And uh, if they do bad, I do the same. I clap for them. I say, yeah, we can do more. Let's do this. Let's do this. So I think I I don't have issues with that because if you look in my defense, in my defense, they are like 20, 20s, you know, they are a bit old, older than me, and I I try to respect that to him. Yeah, so right. sometimes if I talk, yeah. So sometimes if I talk, I I I know what to say. I don't shout anyhow. It's moments, you know. I pick moments where I will talk, and uh, I say the right word at the right time. It's not just about talking, you know. You just pick some word and talk. That's it. Uh, the hardest place to be in football is the dressing room. The things that happen in the dressing room does not happen on the football field. It doesn't happen in the training ground. What are some of the craziest moments that you have experienced in the dressing room? Maybe at halftime, the team is losing, and somebody is in the on, maybe inside the dressing room trying to play music or trying to joke, and then the whole place exploded. Do you have have you ever experienced those kind of moments? In your, you know, short football career, whether at the national team or at Click Sports or in your current club. Yeah, when I was first of all, when in the national team, if we have a match, if we go into the match, first of all, we will sing in the car. Then, if we go to this place, the venue of the match, then everyone will be focused, you know. But in Europe, it's not done like that. Uh, they play music in the dressing room before the match, and uh, when you when then when it's first first half and maybe you're losing, the coaches will try to encourage you, they tell you your mistakes. But it's hard sometimes in the dressing room when we're losing. You see us fighting each other. You're supposed to do this. You're supposed to do this. You're supposed to do this. Why didn't you pass that ball? You know because we are losing. But when but when we are winning, when we are winning, even if you. You didn't do it. Nobody will talk to you because we are winning. So winning covers everything. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, so sometimes, uh, sometimes when they are fighting, maybe when someone make mistake, I try to say, "Hey, bro, calm, calm, calm. It's not, it's not done. We can, do, we can still do it in, in 45 minutes. We can win the game." So we try to encourage each other. Sometimes, sometimes when they are, when they are shouting at each other, I will just be cool, like. Just be looking at them, then the coach will settle it and say, No, we don't need this now. We need to do as a team now. This is where we need the teamwork, help each other. So because if we take it inside the pitch, you might you might get a pass to give to the other guy and you won't give because you guys are fighting. True. So so uh, so we try to we try to we try to help each other and if we win, we win together. If we lose, we lose together. So what about the language? I mean, you're in yeah. a country that doesn't speak English. Uh, and recently somebody asked me a question on my show that how, okay, we're talking about uh, the Chelsea goalkeeper this morning. It was this morning, it was Precious Amosue who talked about communication and language and all that. And I said to him that, that what I know about football is when you enter that field, football speaks the same language. Football is like music. But talk to me, how have you been able to adapt to the language. Did they give you a language teacher? Did they bring somebody to you and say, okay, this is your teacher? Have you been able to adapt to the language? Uh, actually, it has been very difficult, you know. You know, you try to you try to speak to your players and uh, 
you, you learn some keywords. When I came first, I was like, I when I signed, I was trying to settle down. I tried to learn more more about the language. Some people said it's a bit difficult, but I said, okay, fine. I will try. I will try. I will try, I will try to do it, and uh, I kept. I kept trying. I so the head coach told me. You don't need to learn everything at first. You just have to try to learn the keywords that you use in the, in the football pitch. And so sometimes if I want to say something, I ask and they will tell me, okay, this is, this is how you say it. And I'll try to hold it to myself and I'll say it when I need it. So I think I'm, I'm learning now. I'm, I'm gradually getting to know more about the language. That's why it's a little bit difficult. Okay, so the common the common word that goalkeeper always use in English language is leave it, my ball, move to the right, move to the left. How do you see that? Um, first of all, what language do they speak in Slovakia? It's Slovak. Okay, so how do you say all of that in Slovak? Like when you're 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 commanding your wall for a free kick, how do you tell them move to the right? You know, you do your hand like this normally or like this. So how do you tell them move to your right, move to your left in Slovak? Or how do you tell them mark your man, mark your man? You know, that thing that looking for some, hey, hey, mark your man there, you hold that man. Nobody, nobody, let no man free. How do you do, do that in Slovak? Say it in Slovak, not in English now. Okay, if I want to say my right is, my right is Doprava, my left is Lava. So if they want to play the free kick, I do like this, I say Doprava, it means they know they will go to, they will go to right. And uh, like when they play the corner kicks on our, my defender nod and I want them to go out, I shout, hurry, hurry, it means out. Okay. And uh, maybe, yeah, hurry. Then maybe if they play football and someone is behind you, I say, creeper. Creeper is like someone is behind you. Oh, like man on, man on you, man on someone you. Is behind you. Yeah, like whatever. It means someone is coming behind you. And then uh, what again? What do you say? What do you ask? When you, when you like, they are crossing a corner kick and you're coming out to receive the corner kick. And so you tell your man, like in Nigeria, you will say, leave it or sell it, sell it back. You know, so what do you say when yeah. you want to tell your defender, leave it for me? Okay, if I'm coming, if I'm coming for, for a cross, yeah, I can use three words. Okay. I can say, yeah, like, yeah, yeah means, me, this is my ball. Yeah. Yeah, I can say mom. Mom is like mom is uh it's it's like the same thing. My mom own is like mine. Yeah, my own. Yeah. And uh it it's it works the same way. It works the same way too. So I can use one of those two. Okay, let's get let's get out of football now. When you first went there. What was the distance between your training ground and the apartment that they gave you to stay? Uh, actually, when I came to say that first, I, first of all, the, I was in a hotel, but the hotel was so far from the stadium. And uh, it takes like 20 minutes walk. And uh, it was so difficult for me. So like we, we complained because we were three. So, so there's this apartment in stadium where the apartment is okay, or there's no Wi-Fi in the apartment, you know. So we said, okay, fine. Since it's in the stadium, we can stay for a while while they fix the house that will stay. And because players are in the house and some players are about to leave the club, so then back then we stayed in the house. We were hoping that maybe probably we we'll stay for like uh, maybe a week before we move to the apart new apartment. And suddenly the coronavirus started and football was shut down for like months so we have we had to stay in that place and when when we stayed in that place i was trying to settle down when everyone came back the players resumed and there was no apartment ready yet so i think i stayed there for like i'm not mistaken for like four months four to five months yeah i was in the same apartment you know Staying there, I cook there. Sometimes it's just like 
uh, one minute to walk to the stadium. It's yeah. in the stadium, but yeah. the beach. So I will just I will just come out, go to the beach when I'm done with training, come out, enter inside, and that's all. So it wasn't it wasn't far, but it was okay. Okay, let's deal with the hard question now. You're a young man, you're in Slovakia. How are, how has it been dealing with women in Slovakia? Girls. You're a fine boy now. You go out to grocery shop, you go out to cinema, you go out to park. <laughs> so how have you been dealing with the the girls in Slovakia? Uh I think, I think, I think, I think it's very hard question because in Slovakia, you have a lot of people that comes from different countries and uh, most especially we sport guys, especially if you're black, they, no they notice you quick in anything you do. So sometimes when you go to shopping mall to buy something, you go out, I'm not a type that normally goes out sometimes. I prefer to be in, inside. So when 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 sometimes I go out, you see some people who come and take pictures, girls disturbing, you know, but it is what it is. It's it's their country and uh, you have to like you try to pay some respect, take pictures with them. But I don't normally go out normally. I'm mostly inside after training. Okay, like today now I came back from training. I've not stepped out of my room. I've been watching football, be on my phone. So it's it's always the same thing how I do, and that is it. Okay, so what's your what are the other things you do when you're not watching football? You're not playing computer game. Um, what are the other things you do to catch fun that is away from football? What are the things you do? Ah, uh, sometimes. Sometimes uh, there are some moments where I'll just off my phone to watch TV. Do they, yeah, yeah. They, don't, they, don't, they don't speak um, English. It's in Slovak. The TV is in Slovak, so sometimes I don't I don't hear what they say. So most times, most times it's just football. I will be sometimes I talk to my family, talk to my friends, talk to my coaches and sometimes I can go to my teammate's house to be together with him and later come back. And most times I spend most of my time with uh Banky in his house sometimes. I go to his house, you know. That is it. Okay, so as we wind down, uh let us talk about some of your best moments since you, you know, chose this career that you want to play football. Would you say that that's your brother that introduced you to a coach in Kaduna, to Pepsi, in Pepsi Academy? Would you say he is the, like, the, the number one person you want to praise for you turning out to become a footballer? Would you say you give all credit to him there? Yeah, I actually, actually, I would say, um, I would say yeah because he he just like he was the one who introduced me to football. But my mom played a vital role in it. Okay, let's know the role that your mom because played. Because I okay, fine. I I lost my dad when I was young. Sorry. And uh, you know, yeah, it's cool. You know, normally the family would like he can't play football because my brother, the one that introduced me to football he plays football but he didn't really go far in football so they, they were like judging him with me they were, okay look at your brother he didn't he didn't go far in football and you want you want to go into football too so they were like telling my mom a lot a lot of things that she can't allow me to play football she can't do this she can't do this but she kept telling them one thing that what i want is what she will choose Wow. So she was she was solid behind me and uh, so most times if they come talking to her, she'll say no because it's what I want. So I think she played a vital role and he also played a vital role in that, in that aspect. All right. Uh now that we are on the last lap of this uh, conversation, we've got nine more minutes to go. 
can you mention like five key moments of your journey from that Pepsi Academy to where you are right now in Slovak? Five key moments, five key things that have happened across the channel from Pepsi Academy, Click Sports. You played in Lagos State FA Cup one time, right? Yeah, I played. Okay, so he was your key moment from Pepsi Academy to Slovak. Five. I think like five good key moments yes, all good. together with the ones that are not No, good. the good ones first and then the bad ones. I think uh, the five key moments was, uh, first of all, was me moving from Northern part to Lagos. Like okay. I left, I left home, I left home completely without no family in Lagos. I went to a new family and uh, that's one. It wasn't, it wasn't easy at all. It wasn't easy. So, and the second one was, I think, uh, me going for the national team when I went. I, I, when they told me you will go to the national team, I spoke to Kutu Limbi, I told him, I can't go because I know I will make it. And he was like, no, you have to go and try. And when I went, they were 13 good goalkeepers. And I think I was the only one that came from academy. All the rest was from NPFL, Pro League, Nigeria League. So I think for me, coming out, standing out in 13 goalkeepers, it's very good. So I think that's true. And uh, coming to Click Sport, I got my first. Uh, I traveled out to Portugal. Yeah, I traveled out to Portugal. And it was good. It was a very good one. It exposed me because I got, I played against some good teams like Sheffield Wednesday, Hull City, Odlam Athletic, Portimonse, like four, four good clubs in Portugal. So it exposed me the more. And uh, what again? Then I think the call up for the national team, I wasn't expecting that I would make the team to walk up to go to the tour in Germany for World Cup. Then I went and uh, then signing for Sered, like it, it was something I can't explain. And then getting the call up, like the last, this call up, I got the super like, uh, so All right, def that is the five, I think. Definitely after the super Eagles game, we're going to call you again and talk to you and find out how the experience, your baptism in the national team, how the experience, whether you get to start or you get to play or you don't get to play. We'll talk about all the experience, meeting uh, players like Osime, uh, Wilfred Didi, Chikwizi and the rest of them. We will talk about that. But before we go, let's talk about some moments that were not so good. Because it can't always be, your story has been so beautiful, everything has been fine. But let's talk about five moments, times where you felt like, you know what, I don't even want to do it again, sir. This football, I don't, want, I don't want to do, I beg. Let me go and learn work or let me go back to school. Let me go and do something else. Moments that were heartbreaking. Uh, that babe that left you, don't come and be for me, holy, holy, yeah. That babe that left you, I said, no, I beg, I don't do it again. This is your boy, money need to come. I don't do it again. Uh, guess who's laughing now? So talk to me, talk to me about that, those era, those moments. Yeah, I think I, I have a lot because, you know, in life, in life, things sometimes go smooth and sometimes they don't go smooth. So, true that. I faced, I faced a lot of things. I faced a lot of things. Sometimes, you know, the pressure from home when they are expecting money from you and you don't have money to send. Uh, it will keep you demoralized. You'll be thinking of home instead of thinking of football. And uh, sometimes, yeah, of course, some ladies left me because I have no money, no club. You know? I couldn't send money to anybody. Uh, you don't expect me that I'm I'm suffering. I'm, I don't even have money that me sending money. So at a point, I wasn't dating. I was just all to myself. But I have this lady that was there, you know. She tried, and she was there. And uh, then I think the most hard, heartbreaking was the one they dropped me in during the 20, like five days to walk up. During the 20 walk up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was dropped. 
it was it was heartbreaking. Like I was so down, you know, but it is what it is. I tried to when I came back to Nigeria, I think I didn't play football for like a week. A week or two. I was just like uh, like oh, yeah, I don't need to play football, you know. I was like, this is the perfect opportunity for me to go to play in the World Cup. But I didn't get to go. So I just I I I at a point I was like then people start doubting, maybe you should go to school, maybe you should do this, you should do this. And I was like, yeah, I'll do this. I it got to an extent that I went to ask about school and they told me everything I need to start school. <laughs> <laughs> but I spoke to my mom about it. <laughs> yeah, I, I I said I will I said I will go to school. I spoke to my mom. She said, okay, fine, if I want to. But she said she just she will support anything I will do. And uh, that is it. I what a great I did moment. everything. Yeah, I did everything. Like she, she is my backbone till date, you know. So this is what it is. I think the most heartbreaking was the one I was dropped at the World Cup. Yeah. All right, don't worry. You got dropped at the World Cup. Don't worry. 2022 or 2026, you will be at the FIFA Senior World Cup and you'll be commanding goal for the national team. So uh, just prepare yourself for that one. I'm sure you will not be dropped there. Just keep doing what you're doing. Now, some people didn't even get a chance to go to the national team camp. Some people at your age. So it has also been good. Thank you very much for sharing your story with us on the Sports Roundup on Elevated TV Radio. Uh, please help us to subscribe to our YouTube channel because that's where we put the video of this interview uh, at Elevated TV on YouTube and share it with your friends as well. But then, as you go, is there any word of advice that you give any young person that is pursuing football as a career like you, that wants to be like you, whether a goalkeeper, defender, midfielder, or striker? Is there any word of advice? What does it take to be a top goalkeeper or top footballer that gets all these chances and are able to take it. Yeah, I think I think there are two things to success, which is work and pray. Uh, they works they works both ways together. Like they work together. You can't do one and leave one. You work and you pray. So um, I think when you when you work in. And you pray, and you have pure mind, like your heart. You know, you don't, you don't owe any anything. I think it will. You you go to greater heights because it's not easy. So we have to we have to keep your heads down, be humble, pray, walk because you need to do for you to be successful. You have to be willing to do what others are not doing. True. You have to like when 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 you when you see something in someone, like maybe you see the way this guy used to kick his football and you don't know how to kick, you, you should bring your pride down to ask how did you do it? Then if you pick and join it to your own, it means you are a little bit step ahead of him. True. So I think I think so I think that's how I that's how it works for me. So I think it's just Prayers, working, remain focused, humble, take anything, forget about what you can't control. And once you can control, handle it well. Forget about anything that will make that you think that will not make you to succeed. I think of the thing that will make you to succeed. That is how. And my advice to the young goalkeepers out there and people aspiring to like maybe looking up to me, stuff like that. I would just say they should just uh, pray and work continue training, remain focused, listening to instruction from the tacticians and mean coaches. And uh, they should just focus on what they want and forget about what people will say because people will try to bring you down. People will try to demoralize you. But the more the more you listen to them, the more you fail. So I would just say they should focus, work, pray, stay disciplined and remain humble. All right, thank you very much. Uh, my name's Sik, Matthew Yakubo. Uh, may God continue to prosper you and may you uh, get to the very highest level of your career. And one day you would uh, give us good representation, bring us honors 
awards and all that for yourself and for the country. And to your lovely mom, we say thank you as well. God bless you. Thank you for being on the show tonight. I really appreciate it. Thank you. All right.